I served in Germany, South Korea, El Salvador. I even went up to Canada for some cold weather training. Um, and so I, 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 Germany, uh, Af Afghanistan, of course, the war over there. But really, uh, it, there was just a lot of ups and downs through the cycle. Uh, I never told anybody. Uh, you know, I felt very good that I was <laughs> with all these people uh, walking with, with all these giants because I, I'm, I kind of still had a inferior, I kind of felt a little inferior because I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be doing this, and so, but I am. So I always felt blessed or lucky or yeah, I hope this just keeps on going. Hello, I'm John Brink and we are podcasting on the brink from Prince George, the capital of Northern British Columbia in Canada. And uh, today's very, very interesting day. Uh, we have uh, Jason Pike, who has an amazing story. And uh, Jason, welcome to the show. And maybe tell our guests where you are located. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, that's South Texas. So we just got over a really hot, hot summer. And so it's nice right now. But no, um, originally, uh, this is where I retired at from the Army. But I'm originally, I grew up in South Carolina, a small town named Fingerville, South Carolina. Okay. And so your retirement area is uh, in the southern part of Texas. But is it in relationship to Dallas? Oh, it's about five hours south of Dallas. Okay. And uh, closer to the water? Closer to the water, about two and a half hours from Corpus Christi, which Corpus Christi is down towards the water. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Jason, you have an amazing background, and you are also an author and with an amazing story. And uh, you have written two books. And the first book is uh, uh, The Soldier Against All Odds, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, so I like it. I wrote one too, Against All Odds. So it's kind of <laughs> <laughs> How do you like that one? Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Wow, that's a and, and so your story is as unique as... I hope in the way as mine is, and we'll make sure that after this, we'll, uh, I did about three books here, and uh, I'll send you signed copies of those books after uh, you know, the show as well. So do share that Wonderful. with you. Wonderful. So, Great. Thank you very much. So the interesting part about you, I found, is that when you were young, you grew up in South Carolina, did you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and then you were diagnosed with a learning disability. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it was. That was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And uh, so, so then that affected your earliest stage of going to school. And so tell us a bit about all of that. I think in hindsight that, I'll tell you about it, but I think in hindsight that affected a lot of things. Um, so at age seven, I failed the first grade. I was diagnosed uh, as a slow learner. That's the only, there was many, many tests that they sent me through. Uh, I think the word dyslexia was thrown around, but that was not putting on, that was not put on the documents at the time. Uh, I, I was a very slow learner and uh, my parents, I think it affected my parents more than anyone else because they thought that education is, you know, they, like most parents, they think it's really, it is important. And so I think they were disappointed and they sort of raised me without any expectations, just kind of let this kid go. Um, and, you know, we're going to, we're going to point our instruction for uh, hope and uh, academic excellence and other children, not myself. And because um, that was, uh, pretty much professionally written up even. And then it, later on, it was also, even after I got out of college, it was written up that I'm a slow processor. That's the best way to define it. Uh, it takes me twice as different. It's, it's twice as difficult for me to do anything uh, than other people, especially if it's new. But if I work and work and work on it, I can do pretty well. But that's 
how the early years were set up as far as having a, uh, a problem uh, just uh, processing information. Another thing on there is that around uh, age nine, I had a di I was diagnosed with osteomyelitis, which is a bone disease. Oh, no. uh, that, yeah, age age nine, uh, osteomyelitis is a bone disease, and it dissolved my left knee. So uh, sporting activities were limited, and so my dad was really he loved sports, and I did too as a kid, but I had to limit that. I, I'm not familiar with that. So what did it do? One part of your structure got affected by it? I've never heard of it. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so so my, yeah, my left knee dissolved. Uh, I, I, I don't, it didn't dissolve completely away, but it became really big ball of pus. This was around 1974. Uh, I, 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 what happened was I bumped it. Like other kids do, I bumped my knee. I must have bumped it harder or differently, but it stimulated something. They told me that was a bacteria, osteomyelitis as a, as a bone infection, and okay. it occurred on the left knee. It occurred on the left knee. I do remember it being very painful where they put these needles into me uh, yeah. to try to get rid of the uh, whatever, the pus, the, the, the disease. So, so did yeah. It, yeah. Did they, were they able to resolve it, or what happened? Yes, they resolved it, and it, it grew back bigger than my right knee, and I so, and I worked on those legs, especially in my teenage years, like the quads and the hamstrings, and the and I and I grew up the muscles around the knee, and that helped me out. Uh, every once in a while, I got and now on active duty, it did hurt, but uh, over overall, I was able to limp. It was okay. Yep. So. You went from grade seven, or you failed grade one, and then you went into the next grades. You finished high school as a slow learner. Then you went to college. Where did you go from there? So I went on. Uh, I went on to. Uh, I had to go to a junior college. Now, at the age of seventeen, while I was still in high school, I joined the Army National Guard. Uh, weekend warriors, uh, you know, one weekend a month, two weeks a year, drinking beer, things of that nature. Uh, at that same time, while I was in the guard, I went on to, I went to a junior college where they could forgive your grades and your SAT scores. And then I transferred into Clemson University, South Carolina, which is a more reputable university. And I graduated with a commission and an ROTC commission. So I joined at age 17 and uh, I basically went with the reserves and with college at the same time. So, and then you want from there on in to the army and, and, and stay there for nine years. Well, I was about nine years in the reserve, which would be the national guard. Right. And, uh, and then from the national guard, I went to regular active duty army service, uh, from the National Guard. Yeah, for, into the Army, right? And mm -hmm. then... I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And I then, was in the Army National Guard, and then I went into the Army. Right, right. And then you went overseas and did a whole lot of other things from there on forward, and obviously had an amazing success story. I just want to take you back because we have amazing similarities, you and me. So, and, and so not to get too far ahead, although you still have an amazing period once you went into the army as a private and you went on from there, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Let me take you back to my background. So I was born November the 1st, 1940, and uh, makes me 83 last week. So in Northeastern Holland, about 20, and you were in Europe, so you know where, and probably you were in Holland, and it can give you a picture of the northeastern part of Holland, about 20 minutes from, 15, 20 minutes from the German border, and then also the access to the North Sea is also about 15 minutes away from us. 
So it's in the far northeastern corner. So as you well know, the Second World War started in 1938-39, but Holland and the uh, Benelux countries, Belgium and uh, Luxembourg, were invaded by the, by the Blitzkrieg army of the German armies in April of 1940. My dad was drafted into the Dutch army April 1940, and the last they heard from him is he was caught in the bombing of Rotterdam. For five years, they would not know if he was dead or had survived. My mother had already two children, one, my sister, one year older than me, and my brother, two years older. And obviously, I was born already during the war in November the 1st, 1940. It was a tough, tough go living in a war zone. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously, things got pretty rough, especially in Holland. And jumping ahead, uh, you know, the, being especially now so appropriate because we see it in the Ukraine, we see it in the Middle East, and in other people, places, war is ex extremely difficult, and you are well aware of it, obviously. And to have a family in war, in particular, uh, where there is no food, and all the other things that you normally take for granted are no longer available. I remember from the time that it was three and a half, four years old, that the bombers overhead from uh, daytime, nighttime bombing started in the middle of uh, uh, 1943 to bomb the German cities. And uh, a lot of them flew over northern Holland to avoid the flak, obviously. And we would hear up to 350 bombers in the air an amazing sound that even at three and a half to four years old, I remember. And we would go outside on the roof, the flat roof behind our house, not because to, oh, we lost, oh, there you are. Uh, we would be on the flat roof, not to watch them, but my mother felt safer to be outside than inside. And in the distance, we could see where they had bombed uh, the northeastern, northwestern part of Germany, where they touched on the access to the North Sea, where the Kiel and Bremen, Hamburg, all those cities were bombed. Be, the whole sky would be red. During the war of uh, the, the hunger, when there was 1944, 1945, and a lot of young kids died and all the people died, the vulnerable once died and thousands of them. And I remember for us that even now still remember the feeling of hunger, even now still, and then the other part is we had nothing to eat because the Germans had blocked access to food and and the and the, to the cold house we had nothing to, no fuel for the fire. And so the mm -hmm. kids would go, uh, my brother, my sister, and myself, when we were four or five, we would go with gunny sacks every morning into the railroad yards to pick up anything edible or burnable. The reason that we did, because they would not shoot us, they would boot us one, we'll be back the following morning. But so from that time, so the feeling of cold, and then the li we were liberated by the Canadian Army, April the 12th, 1945. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and from that point forward, and, uh, you know, I was so impressed by the Canadians that I always knew from that point forward, once I grew up, I would go to the land of my heroes in uh, Canada. I did when I was 24. And I've been here now 60 years, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And and then the other part about it, as you well so well know, Jason, is that we saw far too much that we should not have seen. 
It, it, the Germans were pushed through the northern part of Holland. They had nothing left. They were trying to get back to the German borders. They blew off all the bridges to slow down the other ones. And a lot of people got killed and shot, and we saw far too much of that. And so we still were the fact that even as young children, that's what I say a lot of times, is now in particular, I usually this week and next week, I speak to some of the schools here, to the young people. I've been doing that for the last 10, 12 years to say, but why do we remember, uh, you know, why do we have the two minutes of silence? And, and it is so important that, especially where we are, is to not take for granted what we have, but know how quickly it all can change. And uh, so I still do that now, and uh, in the next week or so, I'll be again speaking to a number of schools about the same things, you know, so to always remember, and, uh, you know, for all those that gave all, made all the commitments. So the other part then, I was aff affected by PTSD, and, and the other part, the fear of losing the one parent that we had, everybody else had their own issues. Uh, I was affected by the inner child. And, and so, so that's kind of my background there. Then the other one where we got similarities, although uh, in, in a way, I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. <laughs> and then they said, what are we going to do with this guy? And my parents were beautiful <laughs> individuals. And they said, well, maybe send him to the school of the Mincy challenged ones. And so fortunately, they didn't do that. So they got, and my grandfather was a master carpenter, but I never knew him. He died when he was 40. But I saw all this amazing work. And my dad managed a small lumber company. So lumber was always in my, my uh, you know, in my genes, if you wish. And uh, so, uh, and so what I wanted to do is go to Canada. I was trying to leave when I was 17. I, I got a job, uh, you know, so they sent me, said, okay, but not going to send him to the school. We'll get him a job. So let's make him a carpenter or a furniture maker. So they put me into a furniture factory. In the evenings, I would go to a college to learn the trade of becoming a furniture maker. So that's what I did. And, uh, you know, but then when I was 17, as you were, uh, you know, we had draft in Holland at the time. So I was drafted or getting trained or, or uh, examined for draft and then go into the Army or Air Force, in my case, uh, when I was 18. So I joined the Air Force uh, at 18. Uh, for some reason, I still don't know why, they put me in special forces, uh, police special forces, and I was there for 30 months. I wanted to be a pilot, but I didn't make that. And uh, so they put me in there for 30 months. Ooh. Then I worked in, in a lumber company in Holland, and then finally, when I was 24, I felt I had failed in Holland, you know, because I fit, you know, all my friends that I was with in school, they had gone on to college, then the university, and I became a laborer. I'm proud of that now, but then it was looked down at. And so, uh, you know, so the... I always kind of felt that I was as good as all the other guys and girls, and, and I could prove it to myself. So I was already quite successful in Holland uh, at a young age after I came out of the Air Force. And, uh, you know, so, and then when I was 24, I wanted to go to Canada because that was my dream. I was going to prove to myself, not to anybody else, but to myself, that I could do it. I wanted to start with nothing. Then I wanted to build a lumber mill. And then uh, so, uh, and I wanted to go to British Columbia because as you know, Canada, that's where they grow all the forest. And then uh, when I came to, Victor to Vancouver, 
I went through the immigration office. I couldn't speak the language, didn't know a soul, and uh, didn't have a job. And then fortunately, there was a German fellow that I talked to, and I could speak German. And he said, I told him what I wanted to do. He said, Prince George, that's where they're building all the mills. That's where the future is. So that's what I did uh, 60, nearly 60 years ago in 1965. I went to July of 1965. I went to Prince George. I came off the bus here, off the Greyhound, and my employees made this for me. I had $25.47, <laughs> one suitcase, two sets of clothes, three books. That's all I had. But the most important part that I had is attitude. I have uh, always a positive attitude, a passion. Whatever I do, I give it everything that I got and work ethic, and what will follow is success. I work harder than anybody else. My employees gave this to me, and, uh, you know, I had, and I wanted to build a lumber mill. I did that, and some things in between. It's all in the book, Against All Odds. And, but even then, you know, uh, people used to say to me, you should write a book about all the stuff that you did, you know, so... And, and, and so I tried it, you know, the, uh, for a number of years. And then I started, stopped, started again, stopped again. And then I knew if I didn't do it now, it would not, work, n not ever happen. So I then started to think about a biography, not about how successful is John, but in spite of it all, going through all the ups and downs, and and uh, all the all, and all the things that go with it, even the things that I wrote it all, everything about it. it, it it's a biography, but you, as you well know, writing books is not easy. And a biography, you have to do it right the first time. You cannot write one and say, "No, I'll do it again." No, you know this is it. So it took me eighty years to live it, twenty years to think about it two years to write it, quite mm -hmm. popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I did. Now the, yeah. other, now, the other thing, I just want to tell you this because that's where the connection comes in. So, and even then I did not feel that I even then was successful. And then this one day in 1997, January 1997, I had already been here for 52 years. I walked into a store, 32 years, and I walked into a store and I opened the book there and the book's title was Driven to Distraction. It was about ADHD. And I said, oh my God, that's me. And all of a sudden, a lot of things became clear to me that hadn't been up to that point. It took me five years. I wrote in the book in Dutch because there was stigma attached to it and I was ashamed of it that now I finally know who I am. And, and so then it took me five years before I even talked to my dog that delivered our two daughters, was a personal friend and when I was already 62 years old, I walked into his office and he said, hey, John, why are you here? I said, I think I got ADHD. And, he, and so we did our due diligence and yeah, indeed I do. And mm -hmm. then from then and forward, then I'm building a company. What am I gonna do? Go to uh, the bank and say, I want to lend from you hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions, whatever, uh, you know, and this is my plan. And then, by the way, I got ADHD and saying, well, have a nice day, right? So, anyway, so then I become more aware of it as I started to look at it and Google and get to know more about it. And the more I found out about it is that where I thought 8% of the population were affected by ADHD, that the percentage is likely well over 20%. And so I wrote a book about it 
ADHD Unlocked. And I will send you a copy of this as well. But again, written by somebody that has ADHD. And so, and very popular. I did this about two years ago. ADHD, and you may find a connection here. This book is not only for people that have ADHD, but also for people that are affected by trauma or other things that makes them in the category or puts them in the category of slow learners. I say that those people should read not only my book, but other books in regards to ADHD or slow learning. And then the amazing thing about it is that the book, uh, the way I wrote it is that you can open it anywhere, start anywhere, and go to any particular direction. So the, it, it changed my life, really. So what then affected me is my dream of going to Canada was the one dream. The dream of building a lumber mill was the other. And then what, why could I not study like the others did and were so successful, ADHD? But then the other part that I discovered, ADHD is a superpower. It allows you to develop skill sets that other people do not have. I can hyper-focus and I can do 20 things all at the same time. Even now, uh, not for bragging purposes, but uh, I have about 10 companies, uh, very successful. I'm obviously an author. I'm a podcaster and, and, and I'm a professional speaker and I do all of that. And people say to me, how, how can you do all of that? I say ADHD. That's the reason. Mm. So a lot of things became clear to me. And, uh, you know, so, and when I saw your bio, the were connections to slow learning and my case ADHD, but, and, and more than ever before, Jason, I'm very, I wrote about it for one, uh, in, in the book, uh, uh, this one, very popular. And, and, uh, and the more I t talk about it with other people and become more public about it, the virtue is not a day that goes by that I don't feel or interact with somebody who said, well, finally, our family member or myself discovered that I'm affected by it and it changed my life, you know. So and, uh, so, and all of that is very important. And then I wrote one more book. The other part is that finding your passion, and it, it comes across in space as to what you do, living the dream. There are so many people that don't like the jobs. I don't know what to do or what you should do. I heard uh, statistics on the one of the U.S. Uh, channels actually is that up to seventy percent of the people that work don't like the jobs, and seventy-five percent of them are looking for another job. So wow. I I wrote a book on that that came out last July, finding your passion, living the dream. Mm. Wow, wonderful. I'm, I'm going to send you a copy. Anyway, so there you, you Now, Now you know the connection uh -huh. and where mm -hmm. the similarities are. The, the, now, the difference with you were, and kind of picking back up again, where we kind of stopped and said, okay, uh, uh, my story here and the connections is now you were in the Army as a private, and somehow you climbed the ladder and mm -hmm. amazingly and became a lieutenant colonel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and more importantly than that, I got uh, three college degrees. I got a bachelor's and two masters. And that uh, I had to. So with my disability, I learned later that I could take it to an educational psychologist and they can verify that you have a slow processor. You need special conditions. And then I have extra time on the test to a standardized test or any test, really. And you get extra time and 
you get you get to stay alone with a proctor, and that reduces my anxiety, and I do better, much better, when I have that condition. So, but again, uh, I don't know if it's ADHD or if it's uh, Asperger. Somebody somebody said I had Asperger syndrome. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. You you were a slow learner, and so was I. But it it was not because. I didn't have the ability to understand. I was easily distracted by things that really didn't interest me, but I have the ability to hyper-focus on things that do. And I still do that now, even today, uh, with my grade seven, if you wish, uh, three times, uh, you know, that <laughs> I'm, I'm very good financially. I'm, I'm amazingly a good writer always have been, and then I'm good with numbers, always was. But, uh, you know, the, the, the issue is being a slow learner, and that's why I believe it is so important for people, not only in my book, but understanding slow learning because of whatever the reason may be, including ADHD. But I'm saying to the people in a general sense, Read the books, get to understand it, you know, because there will be somebody in your family or in your friends or the places you work or around the world, you will always, in, in, uh, you know, you will encounter them in different places and they tend to be somewhat different, but they, it is a superpower. And that once directed well, no different than with you, once they directed you well, they're very, very good in many, many areas. And, and that's why I call that once you start training and educating persons to fit their, I don't like to call it a disability. I like to call it, uh, you know, like in this case, the superpower <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, the ability to absorb, they will be very, very good. Hence, you are a perfect example of that. I like to think I am as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I was interested in something, if I could focus on something, re reading and writing were always my worst subjects. And so that, I had help. I had a ghostwriter to help me. Uh, I have the story, and I'm able to communicate the story. I'm able to do podcasting and do the expression but writing it and even reading something takes me longer and uh, it's more laborious. I have an entire chapter in the book called Where There's a Will, There's an A, as in the letter grade, and all the different techniques I used to uh, compensate for my slow learning and kind of like uh, how to study. It kind of, I, And so I, ha I have that written out in the Where There's a Will, There's an A chapter. I like it. And what is your second book then, uh, Jason? So the, the second book is a much shorter book, and it's more of a Veterans Administration self-help guide uh, out of the uniform, back into civilian life. I just don't think a whole lot of it. We're coming up on Veterans Day here in America and uh, uh, on the 10th of November, but I don't think a lot of veterans really understand that there is so much more to the Veterans Administration than just health care than just money. There are right. second and third order of events. That's right. why I break this down a little bit. That's kind of what I do. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about your career. Uh, you know, so you came as a, uh, you know, the, uh, as, as a regular soldier into the army, once you went from the reserves into the army, how did you then progress the way you did? Were you studying? Because what I hear you saying, you finished college and you have a couple of masters and, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. obviously you did a lot of training. And then mm -hmm. in addition to that, your career as you went up the ladder. Yeah, so I went up the ladder. I uh, went from an E1, the bottom, the lowest bottom, E1 to E4 in the Guard, the National Guard, still the Reserve Force. Then I became an ROTC cadet at a university, which is in training to become a commissioned officer, went through the cadet process. And then I went to second lieutenant, which is at the bottom of the officer ladder, made it up five steps higher to a lieutenant colonel, 
a lieutenant colonel is a senior management, senior manager in the Army. Um, so I went through a whole lot of assignments. Uh, nine years were overseas in different countries. Uh, I served in Germany, South Korea, El Salvador. I even went up to Canada for some cold weather training. Um, and so I, 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 Germany, uh, Af Afghanistan, of course, the war over there. But really, uh, it, there was just a lot of ups and downs through the cycle. Uh, I never told anybody. Uh, you know, I felt very good that I was <laughs> with all these people uh, walking with, with all these giants because I, I'm, I kind of still had a inferior, I kind of felt a little inferior because I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be doing this, and so, but I am. So I always felt blessed or lucky or, yeah, I hope this just keeps on going. And uh, and so I did. I just went up the ladder. I did volunteer for a lot of the, I mean, I do have over 30 medals and awards. Uh, my, 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 I've got a lot of rack there. I, I, I volunteered for a lot of things, extra, extra jobs, uh, airborne, jumping out of airplanes, jumping out of helicopters, doing a little bit above what my normal job would be. So I went above and beyond on that part. Did get in trouble. I almost got kicked out of the military three different times on three different occasions. Uh, some my fault, some not my fault. But it was the ups and downs. Uh, I had a lot of awards and a whole lot of commendations, but I had a whole lot of trouble along the way. Yeah. So the, the, that's what makes the story so good. Yeah, that makes it interesting because I can say the same. Although my career in the Air Force was not anything near you, I uh, I never went beyond being a common soldier. And uh, but in the Special Forces, so uh, I had the training, and uh, you know, and so it uh, uh, was interesting. And uh, we were ready for war, as you remember, maybe uh, Dutch New Guinea, uh, the Indonesia. Uh, took it over, and we were within a week of having to go down there. Fortunately, they said, well, it's not worth it, so forget about it, you know, uh, respectfully, and uh, so I didn't do that. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so, but then the career that followed, and, you know, that if you go to Canada and you can't speak the language and you don't need a soul and, and mm -hmm. you don't have a job, I started as a lumber pilot, or a cleanup man, and then a lumber pilot. But my dream was to build a lumber mill, and I did that. And uh, uh, you know, and and I'm proud of it. And uh, that's not supposed to happen either. How can it happen that this guy at 24 comes here? He does have a suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and uh, and then builds a lumber mill. You know, the how can you do that? You know, so, but mm. but everything is my view, everything is possible. Attitude, passion, work ethic. Nothing, nothing uh, can stop you once you are determined and don't give up. And that, yeah, that's, my, what I, that's what I see in you, Jason. Uh, I, I have one of my three things where show up at the, even if you don't know anything, you show up at the right time, at the right place, with the right attitude, and if you do those things, you're showing up, uh, and you're you're above fifty percent because a lot of people won't show up for work, and then those that show up, they, they may not have the equipment to show, they may not have the proper equipment, and then those and then they even then if you had this right attitude, you're doing better than fifty percent, and so that to me is uh, even don't, even if you don't know anything, uh, you're doing better than most, even if you that's all you got. <laughs> as, as, as long as you have, but I say. Good people are hard to find. If get, find me people that have attitude, passion, work ethic, I can make them anything in my organization. Bring me somebody that is an expert, has a lousy attitude, no passion, <laughs> and and lazy. Here, a lot of times, is they kind of feel like uh, you have to give them a medal just for showing up to work. You know, or uh, mm -hmm. saying, "Oh, high mm -hmm. five! You showed up for work." I used to be mm. there half an hour before anybody else gets there. And then I'd be there longer than anybody else. And then sometimes I think, you know, it. the key is being noticed. And as you said, timing is everything. And for me, it was just a matter of time. I was here for a year, less than a year, a little over a year, I, precisely a year, 
but I had been cleaning my lumber parlor, and I was noticed, and very quickly I was a superintendent, and then very quickly I became a manager of an operation and an owner of things, and within 10 years, I had my own mill, and then from there on in, even at 83, I'm still very, very ambitious. We will grow our companies, even although things are a bit of a challenge, but that's kind of the way I look forward. I'm going to know what I'm going to do 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And then, yeah, 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 and, yeah. And then the, other thing, the other thing that I see you doing is I'm very conscientious about my health, my diet. I go to the gym. I, uh, I'm a bodybuilder. Uh, I do bodybuilding and physique. Uh, competed actually here, bodybuilding and physique in Northern BC. Came in second, uh, bodybuilding third in physique which qualified me for the provincials. Again, came in third and second, which qualified me for the nationals and the Arnolds. And then COVID uh, came, and, but I'm, yeah. I'm training again now to at 84, again, go through the same. I want to get to the uh, Arnolds at 84. And that makes oh, me great. virtually the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America. Why not? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, F physical fitness have always been a big deal for me, and so it's this is just something that I think it's more mental to get get things off my chest, and uh, it's just a cleansing process. And then and then I'll go to the sauna, and then after that, the sauna I have a facility where I I jump into an ice bath and I do that contrasting that cold and heat. It just makes me feel good. And yeah, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've always done the physical fitness part. And then the 5, 10, yeah, I'm always thinking uh, down the road, uh, 5, 10 years. Uh, my dad my dad always says, what's your five-year plan? And we just, that's what I'm looking. I, I've kind of visioned that. I have a vision. Uh, when right now I'm looking at another book, and I'll, I've got some other ideas for other books. Um, yeah, and like you, I've li I haven't got out there yet. I'd like to get a niche into a little, into some groups and do some talks. Uh, those are some things that are on my mind. I've done one or two, but... Uh, I want to do more of that, but uh, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, I've already blasted, I've already blasted over all the family, uh, the performance has been way over anybody in my family, it just blows everyone away, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my dad used to say, what the hell, son, how the hell did you do all this, and uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know, hell, I'll, I'll write a book, <laughs> so, yeah. but it's really dedicated to my father, so, yeah. Yeah, and is he still alive? No, he did. He passed away in 2011. Uh, when I was, yeah. So he's he's passed away. Now. Yeah, yeah. Mother and father. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, same for me. Uh, so the, uh, you know, I I still believe that uh, the other thing that I do is, uh, you know, I do a a fair amount of uh, keynote presentations and speaking. So I like that, and uh, I like to share with others. Uh, you know the. Uh, especially, uh, you know, the challenges along the way, and then the qualities that I believe are very important for young people in particular, you know, to find, find that passion, find what you're going to do for a career, and then become good at it. And that mentality, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, the attitude I find a lot of people are negative and, uh, and, and we are so lucky and so fortunate, especially if you look around the world right now of being in North America, uh, you know, the, uh, it, it is, uh, you know, a blessing to be here. And especially when you see the Middle East and then, uh, uh the Ukraine and, uh, you know, in those kind of places, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. The uh, situation is just, History has a tendency to repeat itself over the cycle of uh, the military world events. It seems like, but uh, again, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of a po I'm, I've always been a positive or optimistic person, and I really don't like to hear a lot of the six o'clock news. I tune it out a good bit. Anybody who's talking negative, and that it does seem like it does sell. Though I mean, it does sell though. But I just it does it affects me. I don't want to think that way, and I don't want to be down always talking bad about everything. So, yeah. And, and I, I'm exactly the same. I always look for the positive side and uh, I avoid negative. 
and uh, so and that's what I do. And then at the same time, uh, you know, the the other thing too that has been important to me, I touched on it a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously being physically fit, everybody doesn't have to become an Olympian or uh, you know go as far as I maybe do, but I enjoy it the same as you. But at least. At least work out or try to stay active 20 minutes to a half an hour a day, five days a week will keep you fit, you know, and then if you want to go beyond that, great. And then the other one is beware of diet, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and diet is so critically important for your overall, overall health. So the mm -hmm. other thing yeah. that I... Yet the, I'm working on another book that you may find interesting is, uh, uh, you know, uh, dying, uh, living young, dying old. And uh, that one is coming out in July. And, uh, yeah. you know, so, yeah, and, the, and that is staying fit, being aware of uh, uh, the medical system and how to be proactive and uh, those kind of things. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, when I went over to Korea, I lived six years in South Korea because that's where my assignments were. And I, I picked up a lot of their foods and uh, one of their, a lot of their foods are plant-based like kimchi, cucumber kimchi, cabbage kimchi, radish kimchi. So I'm big on kimchi. See, kimchi has a lot of, it has red peppers in it, it has garlic, it has onions. Uh, uh, there's just, uh, it's delicious. Uh, it's raw. And it's, a lot of it's a lot of a lot of them think it's rotten, but a lot of it's fresh. It's not that, that the old rotten stuff is years ago. Yeah, yeah. We do. Uh, my wife, in particular, she is vegan, and uh, you know, so in and uh, and I'm probably eighty twenty. <clears throat> I do all the shopping once a week. I do the shopping. I'm always going to the grocery store, and I go through the outside part of the grocery store and especially to the vegetables but not much in the middle where most of the food is not the healthy foods and uh, so that's usually what i do okay yeah good healthy diet exercise and positive thinking and yeah having a passion having a purpose having a purpose uh what 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 interests you what you want to get into so, but my, I think my biggest passion after the army, I, I kind of got burned out from the military and uh, I always wanted to write this book because I figured that I defied the odds in ways that I, but I, I just wanted to write this book for years and, it, and it, then it took me about two and a half years to put it on, to put it out there and publish it. Uh, and then say, so, and I did the audio book as well. So if people don't want to read it, they, they have my voice on the audio book on the, First book, be uh, a soldier gets all lot. So, um, I but yeah, the yeah, I did the same for all my books uh, are on audio, and I think that is important. And I read them myself, and I believe that part is important as well. You know, so but I really enjoyed uh, doing that. So, uh, so are you working to work? So, what are you doing now? You're active, obviously still uh, looking at the books, and then what else keeps you busy now? So I do the podcasting, still promoting the books, and practicing on my delivery style, which you're helping me now. I am working on another book, which is Toxic Leadership. In other words, what to do in a work, wicked workplace, what to do. It's probably going to be military. We're going to try to see what we, what, just like you said, uh, so many people hate their job. And then, and it's not necessarily that as much as it is, what do you do if you're just in a wicked, toxic environment uh, and how to, uh, and I want to approach that a different way. And uh, that's what will be, be in the next one. I, I was stuck only uh, one or two, once or twice I seen some toxic leaderships in the army and it sort of it haunted me. It, it sort of haunted me a bit. And, uh, and so I wanted to want to deliver my take on a lot of things. Yeah, and I find that interesting, Jason, because uh, I do a lot of uh, keynote speaking and, and do public speaking uh, a lot. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I just want to tell you a little bit about background down there. I, I didn't used to be easy for me before 1990. I had difficulty interacting 
with more than three or four people, mainly in my company. And, and so I was not very good interacting with more than people than that. And then by pure coincidence, my ex-sister-in-law dragged me to an organization called Toastmasters. And, and I went down there and I said, what is it all about? She said, you will like it. Uh, listen to it. And I said, okay, so uh, are they going to ask me anything? She said, no, you just sit there and listen. Halfway through the meeting, Somebody said, uh, and John, tell us about it. I said, oh, my God, I'll never go back here. You know, I stayed there for 10 years, became a distinguished Toastmaster, which is the highest level of Toastmasters. Only millions of people have followed Toastmasters. Less than 1% become distinguished Toastmasters. It changed my life after that. And without that, I could not do what we are doing I could, uh, it opened up that between coming to Canada, having the dream of building my own lumber mill and proving to me that I could do it, not knowing that I had ADHD or, uh, you know, and then the other part was going to Toastmasters from 1990 to 2000 and then becoming a writer and, and a professional speaker changed my life. No question mm -hmm. about that. So I'm now much more active on talking about these issues that I went through and sharing with others. Uh, may it be ADHD, may it be finding your passion, or against all odds and all the ups and downs that you went through and still staying the course and now taking the things that I've learned from there to the others. And, uh, you know, the other interesting thing I was just going to mention is a lot of things what I do now, and especially working with management, I believe I'm very good at managing. Uh, you know, I obviously had more than 60 years experience. But the other one is that I like structure and management in an organization. I, I usually say because I was in the Air Force, I want structure. I don't want any surprises as to who is at what level and how do the uh, directions and the decisions are made so that there is structure, so that, uh, you know, those kind of things. And, uh, you know, so that's so one piece of the, uh, and, and I'm sure you have the same. I still, from that 30 months that I was, in the uh, Dutch uh, Air Force, I still have habits that I developed there that are still with me today. Oh, yeah. I like to, when I was in management, I would power it down. In other words, I really want people down at the bottom to make the decisions. And even if you make a mistake, that's fine. Learn from it. But really, only things that are just really critically important would come up to me uh, life, limber, pro property, things of that nature, money. But other than that, I'm trying to keep it all down so they own their, they own it. And then it comes to me if it was a really severe, maybe a personnel problem or things like that. But uh, yeah. yeah, I like to power it down. I power it down. I delegate it down. And uh, that may, and that gives me the freedom to look out. So I want to be able to have them all trained up with all the resources. And then my thought, and I'm always looking like a year out or two years out, how are we going to do more or do do something different? Or it gives me the freedom of thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I say the same to that level of supervision at that lower level. Own it. You know, that's, uh, you know, and be accountable for it. And then my job is to make sure that you stay in the right direction and, and, and have accountability at the same time. But I say own it. You know, that uh, when you leave, you say, okay, Everything is in place, so uh, you know th that's the key to success. You know. No, oh, yeah, yeah. So I was really good as a commander. I swear, when I was in the big, big in charge of the detachments and so forth, I was really good in that. When I had to do things, I had a lot of trouble. If you gave me like a particular task on a computer where I had to do some detailed type of work, it took me a whole lot of concentration. I didn't, and that was that was tough on me to do that, I'd, I'd either have to get help or it took me a lot longer to 
understand it and then to practice it. Um, so, uh, but I was better, more of a manager than I was actually doing the things, you know, doing stuff. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how you discovered, you know, the uniqueness of who you are in terms of slow learning is being something that has been part of you, but you've been able to manage it. You were aware of it. And then you were able to manage it that then took you through college and, and university to get the degrees and obviously brought you into the army and uh, at first into the reserve, then the army and brought you to the senior, senior level as a lieutenant colonel. That, uh, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. and amazing for, for me being ex-Air uh, Force you know, to rise to that level, uh, very significant, I believe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Personal relationships, being, being humble. I mean, you might not know how, I may not know how to do stuff, but I would, I would tell them, I, I don't know, but I'm your leader and we can work on this together and we can go for our, you know, accomplish the mission, but don't act, you know, don't be arrogant and stay humble and, uh, tell them, just tell the people the truth that, you know, and, uh, they'll, they'll, I, they should understand but then I came from a low level anyway and they they kind of knew that I came from the ranks so uh, that that gave me a little bit of credibility as well being the humble baby credibility and then they do I did extra in other words I did these extra schools these badges that I and re awards I got they saw that and so yeah and uh, I never did say anything about you know a, a disability or a learning problem I just said you know I'm just doing the best I can and there's there's some things I just don't understand and, uh, but they, I mean, but then, yeah, so I did, I did pretty well with going up through the ranks and um, yeah, I, wish that. I was, I was always mystified. That's the thing I was. And, and the question was from the family and friends was, how did a, how did a dummy, how did a dumbass like you do all this? And so now I've got a book out that answers the question. So, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's what, <laughs> but so you, were, passion. you were unique and, uh, and obviously, that's obvious. Uh, you then made available to them the path in which you did it. That's why I'm going to share my book with you, because mine is the same and the same path as uh, uh, people would say, uh, grade seven, how, how could you possibly go all the way up there and be a leader in your industry and in the community uh, with all you got is grade seven? You know, and, and uh, so... And I'm proud of that because what I'm saying, basically, my learning school was not the building there that has all the classes in it. My learning school was life. And I lived a lot of years and in challenging settings. And, and then the other part that I've always been uh, very involved in the culture of the communities and respectful of those people around me. And then I always feel I have to give back. And that's what I have do, done and still do that today. You know, so that's been very, very important to me. Yeah, I give back in the form of, I got a charitable uh, donation account where I'll give to veterans groups or various other folks that are challenged situations. And uh, I'll, I'll give through that account. And then of course, everything that I, I don't make much money on here anyway, but, uh, anything that's, I, I but I give every year. So, uh, but no, uh, yeah, giving has been a part of it. And, but yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I can see what you're talking about now, as far as how we're a little bit, uh, similar, very similar. Um, and that, that word you talked about superpower, I heard an author talk about it. They had, they had a so-called disability. I, it was something else, but, um, I, he had talked about a superpower, uh, and you, now you're the second person he's, he's, he's made that connotation of a superpower. There is no question in my mind about that, uh, Jason. So the, the other part in terms of giving back, I found your second book is again showing the way to veterans as to that the vet, veteran, uh, veterans reserve is not only for that what sounds obvious, but it goes far further than that. And you made that available to your community. That means so much to you, you know, so. 
Yeah, but when I was getting you know, when I was getting out of the military, you know, the the best thing to do when you're getting out of the military uh, is get is is give all your medical documents, uh, exit docu- all your exit documents to a veteran service officer because they're credentialed and they know how to package everything to get yourself to get yourself into the veterans administration. Exactly. Well, the problem when I was in Germany, they were. They didn't want to see me for some reason. They they were gone. They were always gone, and they didn't they didn't have enough. They didn't. So I had that. I knew somebody in Washington D.C., but they said you're out of my jurisdiction, and so I had to sit down and actually go through the regulation myself, which I do not advise you to do that. <laughs> but uh, I did that. I, had to, I did. I wrote it. I wrote down the best I could. I went really slow. I think it took me. Oh my God! Eight months to put it down on forms and to get all my documents, and I just and I learned a whole lot doing it, and I came out really, really good as far as a percent. I'm hundred, hundred percent. I'm doing really done, done really well in it. Even with the people, they, how did you do that? And so, I, well, I just built. I, I just took my time to study it really hard and to write. So now I've got a book out, and um, I love it. No, just like just like you have a tax. Just like you have taxes, most people take them to someone who's an expert. Right. Well, if you're getting out of the military, you take it. You re- you really want to find a good veteran service officer. But if you if you want to look and do have some resources and links and things of that nature, there's some backup information. It's kind of like a like a, a self help check, just a check guy. Yeah. Yeah. So where are they available, Jason? Uh, have you got a website uh, that? Uh, mm-hmm. What is your website just for our guests from around the world? You know, that's, yeah. you know, jasonpike.org, J-A-S-O-N, Pike, P-I-K-E, like Pike speak, jasonpike.org, and that'll link you to my website. The Both of the books are on Amazon under Jason Pike, but jasonpike.org will give you the books, and it also, my social media handles are on the website as well. And, and, and again, to mention, they are also available in Audible, at least the first book is not the, the first second book. one. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The first so, one, because this is that. That's the. This is the good, entertaining, uh, inspirational memoir. Right. Uh, and it's in my voice. This right. although the second one is more. It's shorter and it's more of a, like a kind of reference guide in, in a way. You know? Yeah, and and the, the the audience for that likely is smaller, r- mainly in mm-hmm. regards to reserves that came out of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, it's going to yeah. be U.S. Yeah. military, uh, yeah, U.S. military uh, veterans. Yeah. Anything else that comes to mind, uh, Jason? We just about uh, uh, ending the end of our show here. So this, this is my book. My first one is it's about love. It's about life. It's about fighting. It's about war. It's about everything. Uh, jealousy. It's about screwing up a lot. And the good, I, I overcame it. The, the good, the fat. The good, the bad, and the ugly, just like mine. Oh, uh, yeah. Just like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but no, uh, it, it's like uh, once I, when I wrote this book, I could not believe it. When I had it in my hands, I was shaken. I couldn't believe I wrote a book. I could not believe I'm a damn author. And uh, so it was uh, still a very proud moment for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel the same uh, as I do. And, uh, you know, but you have such an amazing story. Uh, you know, think in terms, I'm not telling you what to do, obviously, but to write more about it in terms of looking at people that trying to find their passion and living the dream, you know, is important. And you have done that through all the ups and downs that go with it and learned a lot that you should share with the rest of the world, in my opinion, and the other part becoming a speaker you you're very uh, oh, yeah. a good speaker already, but I believe that's what I found to be extremely rewarding. I think that would be very rewarding for me is to get into more into the public speaking realm and to get out there. Uh, just kind of did all these podcast these podcasts have got me not everybody's asking for podcasts right now, and uh, and then I've got my other book coming up. But yes, I would like to do that. Um, that would be that's another step that I would like to go into is public speaking. Jason, it was a pleasure. Uh, I'm proud of you. Uh, and uh, let's talk again in the future. You know, and in the meantime, Please. I'm going to send you, sign these books for you, get them in the mail to you. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'll I'll give you some of my books too. Yeah, I I like that, uh, Jason. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Sounds you... good. All right. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.